allow students to continue from where we left last regarding the various perquisites and their taxability. We move on further to other perquisites which include gifts. Now gift can be given by employer in cash or in kind. Remember, gift by employer is considered as taxable perquisite under the head salaries. But if gift is given by a person other than an employer, then that would be taxable as income from other sources. So if at all you have gifts, be careful. If it's from employer only, then it is taxable as salary. Now if you give, get a gift in cash, then it is fully taxable. But if you get a gift in kind, it is exempt up to 5,000 and taxable beyond 5,000. Say for instance, your employer gives you a cash or a check of 6,000 as gift, it would be fully taxable. However, if this gift is in the form of a kind, say he gives you a watch or some uh, digital appliance, then it would be taxable only to the extent of 1,000. 5,000 being exempt and above that is taxable. Then is credit card. If the credit card facility is given to the employee by the employer and there is any expenditure incurred by employer in respect of credit card, either the original card or the add-on card, then the value that is spent by the employer becomes taxable in the hands of the employee. Simple rule, cost to employer is the taxable value of perquisite in the hands of the employee. Any amount which the employee pays to the employer for use of that benefit gets deducted from the value of the perquisite, which means that is the concessional value of the perquisite. However, if the expenditure on card is only for official use, any official benefit is not considered as a perquisite and therefore not taxable. But to that extent, the employer has to give a certificate. So there has to be a proof that the amount that you have spent is actually spent for official use. Club facility. Any expenditure incurred by employer in respect of any club facility may it be annual or periodical use of the facility that would be taxable in the hands of the employee. Once again, similar to what we have done earlier in case of uh, credit card, if you spend the or if you use the facility for official use, to that extent the amount gets deducted. And if the employee pays something to the employer, that becomes a concessional use of the perquisite and therefore the amount paid by the employee to the employer also gets deducted. In certain cases, this value of perquisite is exempt from tax. And that is, one, if the expenditure is on health club, sports facilities or similar facilities, provided to employees at official premises. So if you are using a gym or a spa or health facilities in official premises, that is exempt from tax, though employer is spending an amount to provide you this benefit. And two, one-time deposit or fees for corporate membership. So if your employer as a company is a member and you enjoy the benefit of the club, by virtue of you being an employee of that company, that is, you enjoy corporate membership, that is also exempt from tax. Other benefits, which could be similar to uh, what we have done earlier, the value is the cost to employer. I've told you earlier also, say you get some shares in discount or you get any product that's being manufactured by the or produced by the employer and you get that as a perquisite, whatever is the cost to the employer becomes the value of that perquisite taxable in the hands of the employee. Less concessional, any amount which is charged by employer from the employee. Moving on to other perquisites. 
where practically we have talked of those being taxable in case of specified employees though however the categorization does not hold good at present we have the benefit on account of domestic servants so the value once again is cost to employer that is what the employer is paying to the servants whether he has paid or payable outstanding either way it is taxable and if it is concessional then amount paid by the employee to the employer would be deducted from the cost to the employer if the gardener by way of domestic servant is provided to the employee and the gardener is given along with the house and the house is owned by the employer so when you have the benefit of domestic servant by virtue of a gardener you have to see if gardener is given with the house and the house should be owned by the employer not hired by him then the value of gardener is not taxable that is impliedly covered under the value of the house but if gardener is given without a house then salary paid to the gardener by the employer would be taxable in the hands of the employee then gas electricity and water if the facility of gas electricity and water is owned by the employer that is he provides you the facility out of his own sources you are working with the gas company or water company or electricity company then manufacturing cost to employer that is what the cost to him is manufacturing cost to employer is the taxable value of work is it in the hands of the employee if the facility is hired by employer then as we have been doing earlier cost to the employer whatever he is paying as the higher charges that becomes taxable in the hands of the employee and any amount paid by him makes it a uh, perquisite at a concessional value so what you are paying to the employer is deducted from the cost to employer in terms of what he is paying as higher charges then we have education facility to employees family members we have certain categories to understand when we talk of education facility to family members of the employee the benefit could be given to the employee in a different capacity and to the members of the family of the employee in a specific capacity if the facility is by way of expenditure incurred by the employer on any training given to the employees let's say there's a training program or a workshop or a seminar or a conference which the employee attends and the payment is made by the employer then that is not taxable why because this is considered as official use of the benefit similarly if there is scholarship given to children of employees so if there is a scholarship benefit given by employer that is also not taxable education facility given to family members of employees so not scholarship but education facility which is primarily by way of the fees of the educational institution either directly paid by the employer or paid by the employee but reimbursed by the employer the value of the perquisite is once again cost to the employer then we have education facility to children of employees in an educational institute owned or maintained by the employer so the children of employee are not studying in a separate school and the fees is being paid by the employer but employer owns a school and children of employee are studying in that school or the employer has an arrangement with some other educational institution whereby his employee's children study in that school now the value in such a case is cost of education in a similar school it's not cost of education to other students of the same school but it is cost of education in a similar school in the locality less if the family members of the employee are studying then 1000 per month per child is exempt from tax now family members here primarily means children of the employee so if employee's children are studying in that school then the employee besides the cost of education as being taxable value gets an exemption of 1000 per month per child 
this exemption is not available for other family members say his child is studying he gets one exemption of 1000 per month say his brother or sister is studying he does not get this exemption then the cost of education in a similar school becomes the taxable value of the perquisite and this can also be a concessional value in terms of any amount which is paid by the employee so practically this rule applies to every perquisite wherever you are paying anything to the employer for the benefit that's provided to you the value of the perquisite becomes the value at concessional amount now we can understand the benefit of education through this example we have a set of perquisites say 1 2 3 to understand how we tax the perquisite on account of education fees for seminar attended by the employee we have just taken that fees for training or seminar attended by employees is not taxable so if 10000 is paid by the employer this 10000 will not be taxable so taxable value becomes nil two fees of employees children is reimbursed by the employer to the tune of 15000 so employees children are studying in an educational institution for which 15000 is reimbursed by the employer so we have done it here the amount is the cost to the employer as the taxable value of the perquisite so while the employer pays 15000 is the fees that's cost to him and that becomes taxable value of the perquisite to the employee three there's a school which is owned by the employer so we have let's say school a which is owned by the employer and the family members of x are studying in this school and the members include son of x and sister of x we have done it earlier for your children you get an exemption of 1000 per month per child but for other than children you do not get this exemption of 1000 per month so cost of education in a similar school is 48000 per annum so the taxable value would be 48000 less 1000 per month for the child so 12000 to be deducted from this amount charged from the employee which means it's a perquisite at a concessional value so 6000 is what the employee pays and therefore 6000 further to be deducted and taxable value now becomes 48000 minus 12000 minus 6000 so taxable value is 13000 but if sister of x is studying in a school which is owned by the employer then cost of education in the school being 36000 that is the taxable value no exemption for 1000 per month but amount paid by employee 4800 to be deducted and therefore 31200 is the taxable value of the perquisite then we have benefit on account of medical facilities remember any facility could take the form of an allowance or a perquisite if it is an allowance it is always taxable except to the extent exempt if given in the act so if there's a fixed medical allowance it is fully taxable because there's no rule which says that medical allowance is exempt even if you spend that whole amount on the medical uh, uh, treatment of your family members it will still be fully taxable but if it is in the form of a facility a perquisite then this benefit given for the family of the employee which constitutes spouse employees children parents brothers and sisters provided they are wholly and mainly dependent on the children on the uh, employer so for the spouse and children dependent or not medical facility would be taxable for parents brothers and sisters if this facility is given provided they are dependent on the individual they would be taxable if this facility is given in a hospital owned and maintained by the employer so you undertake the facility in a hospital which your employer owns it is exempt from tax similarly if the hospital belongs to central government state government or a local authority that is also exempt from tax 
a private hospital if it is recommended by the government for treatment of government employees that too is exempt from tax any specified medical facility as per rule 3a you will study more about it when you come to the chapter on deductions but if you are covered under any or you are taking treatment for any problem which is covered under rule 3a in a hospital which is approved by chief commissioner income tax then the amount spent in that hospital is also exempt from tax health insurance premium paid or reimbursed by the employer is also exempt from tax so we have a set of facilities of medicine where the benefit is exempt from tax for treatment of family of the employee which constitutes spouse children and parents brothers and sisters besides these any other facility any other expenditure incurred or reimbursed by the employer for providing medical facility is taxable so primarily what comes to mind is a private hospital so if you undertake any treatment in a private hospital not approved by a commissioner then the amount spent by the employer would be taxable in the hands of the employee then we have benefit on account of car it's slightly complicated to understand car why because there are too many combinations that one has to keep in mind when we are talking of taxability or perquisite on account of car now what kind of benefit comes to our mind when we are talking of benefit on account of car one the car itself is an expense by way of depreciation so there is an expense on account of depreciation two the running and maintenance expenses your insurance petrol and all that is another expense of car and three if you have a driver you have salary of the driver so primarily three things come to our mind when we talk of expenses on account of use of car running and maintenance expenses depreciation and driver now when we talk of perquisite on account of car there are three things that you have to be careful about and once you are clear of the combination of those three things then we come to the value of the perquisite one who owns the car the car could be owned or for that matter even hired by the employer so car belongs to employer it can also be belonging to the employee so the first thing you have to know is to whom does the car belong employer or employee two who incurs the expenses on account of the car say so car belongs to the employer but expenses are borne by either the employer or the employee so it can be car of the employer expenses could be borne by the employee quite possible you have your own driver but the depreciation belongs to the employer or the expenses are incurred by the employer the widest range of perquisite car belongs to him expenses are also borne to him for the second set where the car is owned by the employee again expenses could be borne by the employer maybe it's your own car but running and maintenance expenses are borne by the employer depreciation definitely will not be a perquisite because it is your car and therefore depreciation is your expense and therefore it is not a perquisite alternatively expenses could be incurred by the employee himself in which case it is not a perquisite at all if it's your car and you are spending on it whatever be the purpose of the car official or private it is not a perquisite third thing the use of the car the car can be used only for official purposes please remember we have done this earlier also for any perquisite be it club be it health be it education be it uh, car for that matter any benefit which is for official use is not a perquisite and therefore exempt from tax two it could be for private use you can use the car for your private use only not for official and three you could use it for both you use it for official use as also you use it for private use so three things you have to see too once you have a question or information given to you in terms of car one who owns the car two who bears the expenses of the car 
and three what is the purpose for which car is being used its official private or both now this is a chart that explains the valuation if car is owned or hired by the employer and let's say expenses are incurred by the employer if it is for official use i have just told you anything for official is exempt from tax if it is for private use then the value is cost to employer same as we have done earlier cost to employer is the taxable value of the perquisite in the hands of the employee now cost to employer naturally includes running and maintenance expenses depreciation and driver if we do not have the amount of depreciation instead we have the cost of the car let's say the cost of the car is 5 lakhs and driver salary is 10000 and running and maintenance expenses are also 10000 now we have 10 plus 10 20 but where do we get depreciation from we have only the cost of the car so if you have cost of the car depreciation is taken as 10% of the cost so if cost of the car is 5 lakhs depreciation would be 50000 so the taxable value or cost to employer would be 10 running and maintenance 50 your depreciation and 10 your driver so taxable value would be 70000 and anything recovered from the employee once again to be deducted for out of 70000 say you pay 30000 so taxable value would be 40000 this is how we value if car is given for private use if it is for both official and private use then we go by the cubic capacity of the engine of the car if the engine is of less than equal to 1600 cc that's the strength of the engine cubic capacity then we do not go by actual figures but we have the value of the car as 1800 per month so given that you are having the car for the entire year for both official and private use in this category where it is owned by employer and expenses are also incurred by employer the value of the car would be 1800 per month if the capacity of the engine is up to 1600 cc beyond 1600 cc it is 2400 per month so it goes up naturally for a bigger car the value of the car is 2400 per month additionally if you have a driver also given to you to 1800 or to 2400 100 per month so it becomes 1800 plus 900 for cubic capacity up to 1600 it becomes 2400 plus 900 for cubic capacity beyond 1600 and remember the expenses recovered from employee are not deductible so if it is 1800 plus 900 into 12 and you pay 500 per month for that 6000 will not be deducted because any amount recovered from employee is not to be deducted for official and private use if expenses are incurred by the employer for a car which is owned by the employer alternately if expenses are borne by the employee again official is exempt and private now since employee is spending the money what is the benefit he is only getting the benefit of car because he is spending on running he is spending on maintenance he is spending on driver so that's not a perquisite it's a perquisite is only depreciation because the car belongs to employer so the value will be the depreciation which is 10% of the cost of the car similarly if it's for both official and private use then if engine capacity is up to 1600 cc as against 1800 the taxable value is 600 per month naturally because you are spending a part of the money on account of use of the car so the value goes down from 1800 to 600 per month and if the capacity is more than 1600 as against 2400 the value becomes 900 per month salary of the driver would be same 900 per month the flat amount we add flat amount of 900 per month if driver is also provided with the car by the employer similar to this 
expenses recovered from employee are not deductible. So practically be careful. If car belongs to employer, whosoever bears the expenses, employer or employee. If use of the car is official and private, then amount that is paid by the employee for use of the car is not to be deducted. If car is owned by the employee, and we have done this, if car is owned by the employee and amount of uh, the expenses are also incurred by the employee, it is not a perquisite, so nothing would be taxable. But if expenses are incurred by employer, Again, official is exempt, private is cost to the employer, less expenses recovered from the employee. Again, similar to what we have been doing earlier. For official and private now, first we will find out the amount spent by the employer. So, let us say he spent 90,000. From that, we shall deduct, depending on the engine capacity, the official use is a flat amount, which is 1800 per month for engine capacity up to 1600 cc and 2400 per month for engine capacity up to or for more than 1600 cc. First we find out the amount spent and then we deduct either 1800 or 2400 is a flat amount again 900 for the driver and any amount recovered from the employee in this case is deducted. Why? Because the car is owned by the employee and not employer. For use of the car, be a little more careful about certain small little things. If the use of the car for official purposes happens to be more than 1800 per month, more than 21,600, then employer has to give you a certificate. That expenditure is incurred on this this journey with this mileage this date and he will give you a certificate which will prove that you have actually spent more than what is allowed under the rule of 1800 per month so that you can claim a higher amount of exemption. 2. Part of the month is ignored. Let us say you get a car for 4.5 months and the value of the car, which we normally take as 1800 into 12, would not now be taken as 1800 into 4 and a half, but it would be 1800 into 4, because part of the month is ignored. We do not consider taxable value for a part of the month. It's completed months. 3. If two or more cars are used by the employee, both for official and private. Sometimes you are using one car, sometimes you are using another car. It becomes very difficult to keep track of the expenses that you have been incurring or cost to the employer in terms of such cars. And therefore, the basic rule is one car is treated as official and private. And rest of the cars would be treated as private. So, one official and private and others as, say you have two cars, car one, car 2. So, you will first consider this car as official and private and the other car as private. Similarly, now you will consider this as private and second car as official and private. So, you will find out the value for both the cars. Let us say it comes out to 30,000 and let us say it comes out to 40,000. Now, the employee is not getting any cash in hand, it is just a benefit on account of car. So, he will choose the one which has a lower value. Why? Because this lower value would reduce his taxable salary and accordingly his tax liability. And fourth, use of car from residence to place of work and back is exempt from tax. If you have a cab service, cab facility, car facility, which picks you up from home to office and drops you back at home. Of course, this costs to employer, but this would be taken as exempt from tax. So, we have examples to understand this. Employer provides a 1400cc car to X for personal use. Expenses of the car include petrol 30,000, so taxable, driver 12,000, taxable, Cost of the car, 5 lakhs, so depreciation, 10%, 50,000. 
Now, since it is personal use, taxable value would be 30,000 plus 12,000 plus 50,000, 92,000. Same car. If it is used for official and personal purposes. Now, since we have a driver also, in this case, we have 12,000 here. We will not take 12,000. We will go by the capacity of the engine of the car. And this is less than 1600 cc. So, if it is for both official and personal and the TC capacity is less than 1600, the value of the car is 1800 into 12 plus 900 into 12. So, flat 21,600 plus 18,000 into 800, that is 32,400. Had this car been given for say four and a half months, then it would have been 1800 into 4 plus 900 into 4. 3. X owns a car again of 1400 cc used partly for official and partly for personal purposes. He spends now amount is spent by employee 50,000 on running of the car and 24,000 on driver but the expenses are reimbursed by the employer. So, there is a cost to the employer to the tune of 74,000. From this 74,000 now as we had discussed now, cost to employer, here 74,000, we fall under this category. We have to deduct this amount as official use. So, less 1800 into 12 plus 900 into 12, treated as official use. So, less 32,400, taxable value 41,600. Fourth, in the case discussed above, if logbook of the car is maintained, and employer gives a certificate that 80% of the car is used for official use. Now see, if we do not have a certificate given by the employer, official would be treated as 32,400. But if employer gives a certificate that 80% is for official use, then 80% of 74,000 will be treated as official, which is 59,200. So you get a higher exemption from 32,400. Exemption goes up to 59,200. So taxable value becomes 14,800. Fifth, a car again of 1400 cc is owned by employer, is used by employee for personal use. Hey, we have use of car for part of the month. Use is from 15th of May, not from April, 15th of May. So, you are using it for 10 and a half months. The expenses of the car are 10,000 per month met by the employer and he recovers 12,000 from the employee for use of the car. Now, car is for private use. So, amount recovered from employee is deductible. So, the cost is 10,000 per month for 10 and a half months and we have discussed part of the month is to be ignored. So, it will be considered for 10 months. So, 1 lakh minus amount recovered from employee 12,000 the taxable value of the car would be 88,000. Then we have the benefit on account of transport facility given by a transport undertaking. The value is the value at which employer provides such facility to the public. So, if it is free of cost for you, what others are paying is the benefit and that is the taxable value less anything that you pay to the employer that is concessional use of the purpose. This perquisite is exempt if you are an employee of railways or airlines. So, if you travel free of cost in railways or you travel free of cost in airlines because you are an employee of railways or airways, what public is paying for the use of those services will not be taxable in the hands of the employee because it is a perquisite exempt from tax. Then we have leave travel concession. LTC. Leave travel facility is provided to the employee along with his family members for going anywhere in India by any mode of transport. You can go by rail, you can go by air, you can go by road and if you are traveling by sea, you can also travel by ship. This is exempt up to the amount of fare by the shortest route or amount spent whichever is less. Say you get the benefit of leave travel concession to travel with your family from Delhi to say Kanyakumari and your fare is 
for the entire family, say 1 lakh. However, you spend only 80,000 out of it, then 20,000 becomes taxable. But if you spend the entire 1 lakh, nothing is taxable. It is exempt from tax. It is exempt up to the amount of fare. But the fare has to be the shortest route. You cannot take a longer route than the route which is prescribed as per the charts of these uh, traveling companies. Family means what? Spouse, children. Family for the purpose of LTC means spouse, children, wholly or mainly dependent parents, brothers and sisters of the employee. And LTC is given twice in a block of four years. Four years means calendar years. So one, you can claim LTC for going to hometown and two, you can claim LTC for going to a place other than your hometown. Now the current block, the running block is 2018 to 21 calendar year. So you can go twice from 18 to 21. However, if you are for some reason not able to travel in the block, then there is a concept called carryover concession. Which means if you have not availed of this facility, it can be claimed in the first calendar year of the next block. So for the benefit of 1821, you can claim the benefit up to December 2022 for the block 1821. But only for one journey. If you have not performed both the journeys in 1821, carryover concession is given only for one journey. This is besides the two journeys that you are eligible for, for the next block, that is 22, 23, 24, 25, right? And this exemption is limited only to the fare, no portrait, no boarding, no traveling, no hotel expenses, nothing, only to the fare. So that is your LTC. Then we come to treatment of provident fund. There are four kinds of provident funds. Statutory provident fund, recognized provident fund, unrecognized provident fund and public provident fund. Statutory provident fund is normally maintained with the government employers. Recognized and unrecognized provident funds are maintained with the private sector. And public provident fund is a general provident fund. The name itself makes it clear public. So anybody, anybody can open a PPF. Additionally, if you are in service, you can have a statutory provident fund and also a public provident fund. Recognized provident fund and also a public provident fund. But for those who are earning from sources other than salary, they can have a public provident fund. Each of these provided funds has four components. Contribution made by the employer, contribution made by the employee, the money is invested by the employer in securities on which the interest is earned, which is credited to the account of the employee, and the money that the employee receives at the time of retirement. Or in case he leaves early, there is termination of service also, he gets the money back. Now, employer's contribution is to be shown under the head salaries. Employee's contribution is deductible under section 80C. Interest also is considered under the head salary and lump sum that you receive at the time of the maturity of the policy or at the time of your retirement or superannuation is to be shown either in salary or other sources. Now, how do we treat it? For statutory provident fund, Employer's contribution is exempt. Interest on PF is also exempt and lump sum is also exempt. And employee's contribution is deductible under section APC. So while all these inflows of employer's contribution and interest are exempt, your own contribution is eligible for deduction under APC. For recognized provident fund, Employer's contribution is exempt up to 12% of salary. So if he contributes up to 12%, it is exempt. Anything beyond, it's taxable. And salary, the same as we have done earlier in case of leave salary, basic plus DA if a part of salary plus commission if it's a percentage of turnover. Similarly, interest is exempt, but only up to 
9.5% of the accumulated balance. See how we show interest. Let's say you earn an interest of 11,000 and it is earned at 11%. So how do we calculate the taxable interest? At 11%, your interest is 11,000. It is exempt up to 9.5. So 11 minus 9.5 which is 1.5. So your taxable interest would be 1500. That's how calculation is done for interest on provident fund. Employees contribution deductible under APC and lump sum received at the time of retirement is exempt from tax, but subject to certain conditions. And what are the conditions? He should have worked with the same employer for more than equal to five years. Or this could also include the former employments. So if the provident fund continues from former to the present employer, his term of service should be minimum five years. If he leaves before five years, this could be for reasons beyond his control. Like in COVID, people had to leave jobs because of reasons not within their control. So if their provident fund was given to them and the period of service was less than five years, the benefit of exemption should be available. And the money that you get from the PF account is transferred to NPS, National Pension Scheme. So if these conditions are satisfied, the money that you get at the time of retirement is fully exempt from tax. Unrecognized provident fund, again, employer's contribution is exempt. Your own contribution is not deductible under APC. SPF and RPF are deductible, UPF is not. Interest is also exempt. Now, when you receive lump sum, this is to be treated like this. The lump sum is naturally a part of it is employer's contribution and interest, another part of it is your contribution and interest. So employer means salary. Anything you get from employer is taxable under the head salaries. So let's say you get five, 10 lakhs. 5 lakhs is employer's contribution, 5 lakhs is employee's contribution. Of that 5 lakhs, 4 lakhs is the contribution and 1 lakh is the interest. So entire 4 plus 1 would be taxable as salaries. That represents employer's contribution. And for your contribution, 4 lakhs will not be taxable. Why would this not be taxable? Because you have not got any deduction on account of APC here. So this has already been taxed as a part of your salary. So this is not chargeable to tax. And interest, since this interest has been exempt earlier, this interest is taxable as income from other sources. So we end here with the explanation of provident fund and its tax treatment. Thank you.